I was at a gig in London, the year was 2009, in Soho, with a couple friends. There's a band playing called the Friendly Fires. They're a loud band, but my friends and I had a problem. Everyone was talking. There was something wrong. This band was playing, and so many people were having conversations that had nothing to do with the music. And phones were out. In fact, they were everywhere. People were texting and stuff that had nothing to do with the music. The music was almost background. The bar was also open. And the clanging of bottles, of beer bottles, into the bar well could be heard, sometimes louder than the quiet parts when you were listening to the band. The two of us, the three of us, looked at each other and said, this is not okay. Music should be about a connection. And we don't feel like we're connecting with the band, with all this stuff in between, or even with the audience. All these barriers came up, and we almost didn't feel like this was a musical human experience anymore. So who were these two other guys? Well, the first guy is a guy by the name of Rocky Start. <laughs> Let me ask you, would you start a business with someone with that name? Okay, the other guy, the very intense looking guy, David Alexander, he was a musician at the time. He's as, ten, he's as intense as he looks. He actually, his musical name was Passion 8 Dave. <laughs> so there were the three of us. Rocky and I have no musical talent, we're just fans. So we had the perspective of the fan thinking, I'm not connecting with this artist, with this up-and-coming artist in this situation. And Dave, well, he was the musician who said, you know what, guys? It's absolutely soul-destroying to be singing to people who aren't really attentive. What's wrong with this? So the three of us said, let's do something about it. Now, our idea was nothing new. People have been having house concerts since Mozart's time and all over the world since. But it was new to us at the moment. We would try to create something special around music. We call them secret gigs because Dave pointed out it was also horrible when there was the headliner and all the little tiny support acts. And you can ignore the support act and go in and out, at least in this type of gig situation, and be rude. So he said, let's not announce who's playing. And let's make it in someone's front room, someone's living room. Why? Because we can control it. We can ask people to strip back the way they are. Well, the first one was in North London, in Dave's house. We all showed up, eight of us. Dave was ready to play. We mixed a few gin and tonics. It was a hot day. Put them in the kitchen, though, and left them there. And we all came into his house and sat on the floor and kind of, it was cozy, it was a small living room. And Dave played five songs, and it was quiet. We were attentive. In fact, it was so quiet, you could hear clocks ticking. And we had never been at a musical experience outside of maybe classical or opera, where it was silent. And Dave performed, and it was a magical hour or so. Well, we loved it. And it was a hobby, and we just did it again. And by the third time, something happened. Word had spread, and the third one, which was around Regent's Park in the middle of London, there was a line down the block. And people said, we heard about this, and you know what, Rafe we, and Rocky, we have the same problem. We want to check this out. And not only that, people said, we want to join. How can we help? Can we clear the furniture out of the living room so we can fit more people? Can we figure out a way to photograph it without getting in the way of what you're trying to create? Can we bring drinks for after? What can we do? And we went on and did three and four and five, and finally had to call it a secret gig in every way because we couldn't fit the number of people who wanted to go into the small space. Then, a turning point. I got a call from Casey, who lived in LA. I didn't know her. She said, hey, I've heard about what you're doing, and we want to do the same thing 
in Los Angeles. To which I was thinking, well, go ahead. It's just... <laughs> it's just a house concert. You can do that. As if she was reading my mind, she said, no, 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 you don't understand. We want to join your community. We want to know how you're doing, and we want to connect and make this thing around the same umbrella where we're all pitching in together. And here is a picture of one in Malibu. And they did it. Well, soon after that, word continued to spread all through word of mouth, and we got calls from Barcelona and New York and Paris, Mumbai, Melbourne. Soon it spread, and over a couple years, it was truly global. And the thing is, people said the same thing. We want to experience something that is human. We want to connect. We want to put phones aside. Yes, there's a great thing about having a phone and taking pictures and all that, but it's actually even better when there are no barriers, when we're human together in a space, enjoying something as special as music. Well, then the community of people started to stretch the boundaries of what was a living room gig. I got a call from the team in Oslo. Hey, Rafe, can we do a gig on the top of that ski jump? Uh, sure, can you? Yeah. There's no Wi-Fi, it's hard to get reception, it'll be intimate, it's cold, but we can fit about 55 people, which they did. And people said, well, hang on, we can do it in any space then. So there were mattress stores in Manhattan, churches in Paris, carpet stores in Morocco. It became something that could be anywhere as long as these simple community rules abided. Please focus on the music. Please don't gab. Put your phone away. Maybe take a picture, but chill. Be alive. Be human. Make it a human experience. And that human experience really started to connect. We had a gig in New York City in the Bowery on the first floor. The door was left a little bit ajar that day. It was a packed room, three performances. After the first performance, the door swung open and in walked a homeless man. He smelled a bit, but nobody cared. He sat down, nobody cared. He was the audience, and as long as he was connecting with his fellow music goers and focusing, it was all fine, which it was. He was as attentive as anyone else. Well, after the three performances, everyone got up to start to leave. And at that time, we were passing a hat to collect money to help continue what we were doing. We eventually started a ticket when it started to grow, but the hat went around that night. And everyone put in a dollar or two dollars, some five. A few outliers put in ten dollars. Well, this homeless man pulled into his grubby pants and pulled out a $20 bill and put it in the hat and started to walk out. Well, the organizer, one of our volunteers from New York, ran after him, just said, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was so generous. To which he said, no, thank you. Thank you for creating a community of people together who made me feel so welcome. And oh, by the way, I've been a musician all my life. And to perform in a space that is sacred, where nobody really sits and talks and people listen, that was special. Thank you. And with that, he left. Well, another thing happens when you're connecting with your fellow human beings. You meet people. How many of you have met people when you go to a concert, except for your own friends? It doesn't happen as often as it should. But on our nights, and hopefully on other living room gig nights, you meet people. And so I take you to Istanbul, where two people who were single at the time sat down next to each other, locked eyes, and flirted. Well, they exchanged numbers. After the so far in Istanbul, they started to date. They fell in love. A year later, they went on a little holiday to Italy, and the guy whose name is Sem, looked up that in Milan, 
there was a sofar on the night they were coming through on their vacation. And he made a decision in his head. And then he got in touch with the Milan crew and applied to come and got in. And he said, hey, can I get up and say something before you start the night? To which the Milan leader said, uh, I guess, yeah, sure. So on that night, Sam and his girlfriend walked in to a room full of strangers, and Sam proposed. I'm going to show you footage, 10 seconds of that moment. But he proposed in front of strangers who he felt connected to because he felt this was an audience of people who were there in the moment, being mindful. magic, as if everyone there knew them, but they didn't. But they shared a human experience. I'm going to move from one community of people attending to the artists. There's a band called Bastille who performed it so far in their early days to a room full of people who hadn't heard of them, which is often the case. They went on to become pretty famous and play stadiums, but at that time they were unknown. And I told them what I told everyone else, please come and play a gig that's stripped back, maybe even acoustic. And oh, by the way, could you do a sing-along? Because it brings people together. Well, Dan, the lead singer, and his band were terrified because they'd never played a gig in front of people so attentive and stripped back. Every musician who plays in this setting loves it, but for many, it's a big challenge. So they took a break, took a deep breath, went to the green room, which was the teenager's bedroom in the house in Belsize Park, and drank some wine. Well, when they came out ready to go, they put in an amazing show. And when they sang their song called Pompeii, which went on to become, I understand, one of the, or if not, the most streamed song in the history of the UK, everyone sang along. No one knew the song, but it was very catchy. And it was magic. Another type of artist, now, something about me, that's Robert Pattinson, the actor. He came into another so far. Now, I couldn't recognize a celebrity, like, if they were right in front of me. And I, I didn't know who he was. And he said, hey, man, can I play a song tonight? He was just a friend of a friend. And I said, no. Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry. No time, we've got a full lineup, maybe some other time. And then his friend, who I knew, said, you know what, he's actually a really good musician, please. And I said, well, maybe if there's time at the end of the night, which there was for one song. So he came out in a safe environment, just as with the homeless person. Nobody cared. In fact, nobody knew him, except, well, there were a couple of very giggly girls <laughs> in the back who I learned later had posters of him in their house. This was around the time of Twilight just finishing. And so he was very nervous, and he had, took him time to figure out, get his way and his vibe on the guitar. But he did an amazing job, and it was magical too. One more type of musician, a beatboxer who's performed, but this time I'll let you hear from him what it's like to perform Strip Back. His name is Reeps One. Sofa Sounds, uh, I think the first one I did in London may have been about two years ago now. It allowed me, as much as it does for the audience, to have a completely unique performance situation. Like if you Think about being on stage in front of 20,000 people and there's a huge gap between you and them um, and you can't perceive that many human beings. It just becomes a blur. Like you, you, you'd think it'd be more scary where it's actually less, it's less intimate, it's less uh, connective than a smaller venue. So to bring that even further, to be in front of a room of people with eyes and ears and nose and hair and you can see every single thing is extremely rare. From speaking to artists that play there, it's as 
equally interesting for the audience as it is for the artists, but it's also more terrifying for the artists that are not used to it. So you get to see as an audience member, like little shakings of the hand and like little things like nuances you wouldn't normally get uh, in performance. The other thing is what I do. You always hear it through a speaker or through a laptop. And for people to hear me like, <laughs> like in person, um, is a, a really intimate experience and I can only do that at Sofa Sounds. Reeves One is uh, one of the best beatboxers in the world. In fact, no one knows quite how he does it and UCL uh, University is studying his brain at the moment to try to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I take you finally back to New York City where I recently emceed so far, and what's happened with this community is they now think about so far when they travel. And so what happens is, in a living room, like with the Istanbul couple, there happened to be people from different places. And so it was a typical night. Everyone was sitting on the floor. We do it's BYOB, so people were drinking wine, and the expectation was palpable, who's going to be on tonight, and it was quiet, and it was a real human moment. And anyway, I asked, hey, who's been to a so far outside of New York and is here tonight? And hey, there was a guy in the back, Melbourne, and then somebody in the middle, I said, yeah, where have you been? Istanbul, Chicago. Okay, I said, one more, how about you? And pointed to a young lady in the front, and she said, well, London, Rafe, at, at your house. <laughs> Thank you.